This is the Married to Doctors podcast, episode number 57. At our wedding, we had made vows to each other, but before I met him, at his med school graduation, he had made vows to his future patients. Our marriage was private, but his profession was not. Welcome to the Married to Doctors podcast. Because we know that being married to a doctor isn't always as glamorous as it sounds, our podcast helps successful homes be happier. We're here to build community, hear your stories, and explore solutions with the experts. Here's your host, Laura McKeldry. Hey, everyone. I am so glad you're here listening to the podcast. It means so much to me that you keep coming back and that you give such amazing feedback. I'm really thankful for all the reviews that I've had lately. If you haven't left me one yet, please do. Apple uses those to help rank the podcast and it helps others to find it. I have had people say that they actually just found it in Apple, which is amazing. So definitely leave me some love over there and keep sharing it with your friends. A couple of announcements I want you to know. If you haven't checked out my gift guide yet, that's kind of fun. That's on my website. So check that out. It answers a lot of etiquette type questions on gift giving around the holidays. And I know that's on a lot of our minds. Also, I am an affiliate is what it's called for the White Coat Investor course that he created. I think it's called like how to fire your financial advisor, but it's really not about how to fire your financial advisor. It teaches you how to make a financial plan and will teach you a whole bunch of stuff. It's about 13 or so hours worth of content and I'm working my way through that. So it's taking some time to give you a true review. But I can tell you that I do think the course is worth the money that he charges for it. Good financial advice is usually going to be a couple hundred bucks an hour minimum. And this is good. This is good stuff. So if you're interested in that course, you can buy it directly from him. You can buy it from a bunch of people online. But of course, I would love it if you bought it from me because I do get like 20% kickback. And that'd be great because that helps me uh, pay for the cost of the show. So if you've been thinking about that, you can check it out. There will be a link in the show notes as well as on my website. Okay, so we are going to have a great episode today. I'm just super excited about the speaker, Anya Groner. I came across her on an article that I read in the New York Times, and she's just an excellent writer. She's currently the chair of the creative writing department at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts, and she's a founding member of the New Orleans Writers Workshop. She stopped writing at Loyola in New Orleans, as well as Xavier University of Louisiana and the University of Mississippi. And she is married to a physician, and she has written about that somewhat. So She's going to interview today, but she's also going to share her essay with you guys, and I think you're just going to love it. It's so cool to hear an author read their own work, I think. So this is going to be extra special. We will jump right into it after a word from this week's sponsor. Thank you guys so much. Being married to a doctor is amazing, wonderful, and stressful, especially around the holidays. I should know because I am married to a doctor. My name is Gail Smith, and while I love my husband and my life, The holidays with taking call, doing the shopping, and visiting in-laws can make your holidays feel less than merry. If you long for a real vacation, call Prescription Travel. We are here to help. Visit prescriptiontravel.com to get the gift you most desire. Anya Groner, I am so excited that you've joined me here on the Married to Doctors podcast. I'm glad to be here. I came across your essay in the New York Times and kind of trolled you a little bit online and found you. And I'm just thrilled that you're here to get to know my audience and for my audience to get to know you a little bit. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself to us? Yeah, my name is Anya Groner and I live in New Orleans and I'm a writer and a teacher and I'm also married to a doctor. Yeah, what type of physician is your husband? He works in internal uh, infectious disease. And have you been with him through the whole journey? No, we met when he was in his first year of residency, so I missed all of med school, which I think is good. I'm not sure that <laughs> that our relationship would have lasted through med school as well. But yeah, I've been through all of residency and fellowship. Great, great. And do you have children at this time? Yeah, we have a daughter. She is almost 13 months old. 
Okay. So you have a really neat career. Tell us a little bit more about your career and kind of where your career was when you met your husband and maybe how it was affected by falling in love with someone in medicine. Yeah. So I had just finished a, an MFA in creative writing in Oxford, Mississippi, and I moved to New Orleans. And actually, we met my very first week in New Orleans. And I was working what I thought was going to be a part-time job, but turned it into a full-time job teaching composition at a local college, Xavier University. But I really hadn't figured out how to fit creative writing into my work life. So it was, it almost felt like I had two jobs. Like I had this job that paid and then I had this writing job that I was doing as well. And actually in some ways it was really helpful to be dating somebody who was as intense about their work as I was, or I would say more intense. I mean, I think I'm, I'm not sure anything is I've done ever <laughs> has had the intensity of residency, but I think that we really could appreciate that ambition in each other and that sort of commitment to work, but also staying with him and the rigidity of his job meant that I was not applying to fellowships. There was a time when I was thinking about getting a PhD and I decided not to do that because I knew that he could not move. Yeah. It's interesting how it ends up, you know, just the dynamics and the logistics end up you know, determining a lot of our life decisions. And I hear this a lot from women and men, you know, that are married to medicine, how they end up taking a job, not taking a job, continuing their education, not continuing their education. And, and really it's, it's the medicine aspect, but it's also just life, right? Like we're kind of in that stage of, are we going to get married? Are we going to pursue a long-term relationship with each other? Are we going to eventually have children? What is this going to look like for us? So Lots of decisions come along the way. Yeah, and it wasn't like I felt hemmed in, like I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. I was actively making those decisions. Oh, there's, now there are times when I'm like, gosh, it would have been really nice if I'd gotten that fellowship and then I could have had a year to, to get more writing under my belt. But. Right. Well, I love that you say that because a lot of times too, you know, we're judged, well, you chose your marriage over your work or something like that. And, and that's not really it either. I think many of us make an active decision to say, you know, no, this is what I want. And I'm okay with making this decision right now. But I often tell my husband, I wish I had about seven lives because, <laughs> you know, in scenario number one, I would have stayed in this town. My very first teaching job, I loved it. I still think I could have stayed there and just lived in the same house and retired and known every kid in that town, you know, after 30 years of teaching there. Like I just have this vision in my mind of how wonderful that could have been. But then I have other dreams of like, oh, I should have, you know, become an occupational therapist or I should, have, you know what I mean? Like there's so many different ways our life can go and sure, yeah. we have to choose, you know, we have to choose. And, and for me, you know, I, I chose to marry a surgeon and he's taken us on this crazy path and we've chosen to have kids and that adds new dynamics to your life. Yeah. And certainly having a daughter now. I find myself making those same kinds of decisions again, where there are things you do and don't do because you choose your family. Mm -hmm. But your writing career has still been pretty successful, right? Tell us a little bit about your career. So in terms of writing, I, yeah, I've written quite a few essays since we met each other. I've gotten some essays published, one in the New York Times, one in the Atlantic and a variety of other places. And I've written some short stories and I am currently shopping a novel and writing a second one. So I've definitely found time to work on my writing as well as also to teach a lot. Now I'm teaching, I taught for six years at two universities, at Xavier University and then later Loyola University. And now I'm actually the chair of the creative writing department at a high school, at an arts high school in New Orleans. And that's, that's my favorite job that I've had. It took a little while to find it. Um, but now that I'm here, I really love coming to class and, and teaching teenagers and also teaching teenagers about what I love the most, which is creative writing, not, not how to write an essay. Oh, I love that. I love that. So fun. I taught high school too for a while. So I miss those kiddos. Sometimes I think teenagers get such a bad rep and they're nice kids by and large, I think. so. Yeah, they're just at a really, they're at an intense they're at an intense age in their life, but I think that's actually what makes them really enjoyable to be around. Yeah. 
So once you knew you were going to marry a doctor, did you have any strong feelings about having this title of doctor's wife? Yeah, of course. I strongly identify as a feminist. And so I think in some ways, just having the title of wife was was a lot to take in, um, you know, to have a title that connected me to a, a man. And then doctor's wife, it, it feels like kind of almost this archaic role, like, you know, like, I, like if I was in some, um, I don't know, town on the prairie or something that I would be running around to sick people trying to trying to get get him to different bedsides or something yeah carrying a big leather bag with all the supplies you know exactly <laughs> yeah and it's such an you know being a doctor is such an important caretaking job that it it does feel like a sidekick kind of name which I wasn't that excited about. No, I think that's hard for a lot of us. And that's, you know, something that's kind of hard to talk about, I think. So that's one reason I have this show is so we can talk about things like this. Because I know I didn't really want to be called a doctor's wife. And I don't know why, because I was super proud of my husband. And so I kept like asking myself, why do I have a problem with this? And I've kind of come full circle with it. Obviously, I have this podcast, so there's no getting away from it now, but I'm just like, yeah, that, that's, that's part of my identity now, and I embrace it a little bit more, but I, I definitely struggled with it for a long time. I certainly, I had a, a few people who I was close with who asked me if I was going to quit my job when I got engaged because I was a doctor's wife. They were making some assumptions about our finances that didn't actually haven't panned out um and then you know and and then it also felt like well wait a second is the value in what I do only financial so that that also kind of stung that it I felt like even people I knew really closely were looking at me and saying like oh well everything I know you as is suddenly getting subsumed or is less important than this new title which I've never never heard you say yourself Right. So that, yeah, it was, it was a little bit, that was hard. And so I, in some ways it wasn't like me taking on the title of doctor's wife. I felt like that title was kind of put on me by mm-hmm. some different people. And of course I am really, really proud of my husband and I think he does wonderful work. So that just complicates it more. Yeah, it does. I remember one time thinking like, just, I don't know. It's it's just kind of ironic. Like I'm so proud of him, but I was at a football practice with one of my boys and, you know, someone had asked me, what's your husband do? And I'm like, oh, he works at the hospital. <laughs> well, what's he do there? Oh, he's in training. Like the last thing I wanted to do was admit that he was a doctor. And mm-hmm. in some ways I feel bad about that. But in other ways, I just wanted to avoid the conversation because, and I feel like a lot of my listeners will relate to this. Sometimes once you say, you know, you're married to a physician, people will treat you differently. And I'm like, am I making that up or is that really happening? <laughs> mm. and, and I've had to ask myself that, you know, is this just me thinking they're treating me differently or are they really treating me differently? It's probably a little bit of both, you know. I think in some cases it may have been more in my head. In other cases, I definitely have seen some distancing from people. I think maybe they get intimidated and I just want to tell them, no, really, like you have more money in the bank than I do, I promise. Like... <laughs> we can be friends. I need friends, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Or I want to tell them like, regardless of how much money you have, you still need friends and money is not a dividing factor. But I think sometimes we kind of self-select friends that are most like us. And sometimes people think, oh, well, that's, that's not me. I'm not married to a doctor. So then they distance themselves. I think now the part that I, and actually maybe all along the part that I found the most difficult is having a partner who is, so busy all the time and with such a rigid schedule and and work that's basically inflexible you know if a patient needs him that's that's where he is and certainly now having a daughter that that's that can be really frustrating sometimes when I'm you know I've been parenting for a long time and I'm ready for a break or I have a writing project and I want him to step in so that I can go work on it that balance can be, or I should say that imbalance, because it is an imbalance, and it's an imbalance that we've talked about a lot, and it's not something that we can change right now. So that's the part, actually, where I end up spending the most of my thinking time is 
what what would happen if I was this rigid about my work? If I was like, okay, well, I'm, I really can't help right now. I'm sorry you're having <laughs> you're having a bad day, or I'm sorry you need help. I'm unavailable, um, which is something that you know that he does all the time because mm-hmm. he has to. So let's talk a little bit about your essay. It's called "Is There a Doctor in the Marriage." Tell us a little bit about you know how you came to write it, and maybe what like your experience was when you went to publish it. Sure. So actually, the, <laughs> it's a very roundabout way that I came to write it. A friend of mine was working on an anthology about airplanes. Um, so he was collecting essays about airplanes and asked me if I would write an airplane essay. And just recently we had had, this had maybe been a couple months before, that we'd been on a plane and they, they needed a doctor. And so I wrote that essay. And then I, as I was writing it, I was realizing, you know, that this is really an essay about grappling with love. So it, then I ended up submitting it to the Modern Love column in the New York Times, and it was lucky enough to get it in. But so, so it kind of, I came to it sideways. I was thinking I was writing about airplanes, um, but that was actually just a, a way for me to get into this other topic about our relationship and what it's like to be married to a doctor and some, some of my personal struggles with that. Yeah. Good. So I'm super excited about this listeners. You're in for a treat because you've agreed to read it to us today. So yeah, yeah, so go for it. Okay. Is there a doctor in the marriage? Six weeks after our wedding, my husband and I were flying back to New Orleans where we live. As soon as we reached cruising altitude, his head tilted forward in sleep. The previous year had been the hardest stretch of his medical training. As a third year resident in internal medicine, he often worked 30 hour shifts. When he came home, he'd still have notes to dictate. I'd frequently find him snoozing in an armchair with the light still on. A few hours later, he'd wake and go back to work. I'm trying to survive, he told me when I complained about how work consumed him. I'm doing the best I can. When we first met, I fell in love with his playfulness as much as his passion. He belonged to an improv comedy group and kept me up talking in funny voices and telling me what he loved about medicine. Syphilis was his favorite disease. He called it a sneaky bug because it can surface almost anywhere in the brain, heart, groin. And he showed me his memorabilia, a plush pink spiral doll in the shape of the bacterium and a tin lunchbox featuring a man in a gas mask and block lettering that read, the enemy is syphilis. The weeks he was on call, I barely saw that goofy side of him. His irregular schedule, which included frequent overnight shifts, left him with little energy for life outside the hospital. As his responsibilities grew, so did my frustration. I wanted to support him as he pursued his dream career, but I couldn't help feeling that his work and I were in competition. Although there was no turbulence, the fastened seatbelt sign blinked on 30 minutes into the flight. Soon, a woman's voice came over the speakers, asking if a doctor or nurse was on board. My husband didn't stir. I put my hand on his shoulder. He was so chronically tired that a week earlier, he had confessed to me how much he looked forward to napping on the plane. Sweetie, I whispered. We were already living together when he proposed. He had cooked a delicious dinner of garlicky shrimp and black bean cakes and asked me to fetch sauce he had reheated from the microwave. Instead of a steaming bowl of mole, I found a navy blue box. Inside, atop a bed of velvet, was a ring. The loudspeaker clicked again. I repeat, the flight attendant began. A few rows in front of us, a woman pressed her call button. My husband's work life was mostly a mystery to me. I rarely saw him in action. Patient privacy laws prevent doctors from taking visitors on their rounds. I felt bad waking him from much needed sleep during the final hours of our overdue vacation, but it seemed important. And I admit part of me was excited too. I wanted my husband to be the hero. I shook his shoulder. Honey, I said, they need you. Groggily, he raised his hand. A flight attendant inquired about his medical license. The other volunteer, a nurse, offered her assistance, but only my husband and the flight attendant walked up the aisle, vanishing behind the curtains that separated us from first class. Whatever the emergency, it wasn't in coach. After they left, I was too distracted to read. I gazed out the window. For years, marriage had seemed as distant and inscrutable to me as the green and brown patchwork below. It was, I had thought, the kind of tame choice that signals a loss of momentum and spontaneity. I had felt giddy about love, but ambivalent about becoming a wife. The word itself seemed like an erasure, privileging domesticity over desire, 
association over achievement. In marriage, I had seen women lose their names, their ambition. By the time I met my husband, my critique of marriage had already begun to soften. I was almost 30, and the adventures of single life were losing their appeal. Here was a man who made gumbo from scratch, met me for runs after work, helped me train for my first half marathon, watched my dog when I was away, and surprised me with yogurt pie, a family recipe I'd mentioned in passing when I was feeling down. Simply put, he took good care of me. He's the kind of person who takes care of a lot of people, even it turns out during the final hours of our vacation. I'm not always happy about sharing him, but it helps when I see us as a team rather than competitors. Earlier in my life, I worried about that team aspect, fearing marriage meant sacrificing my identity. After we announced our engagement, my fear seemed justified when friends started commenting with knowing smiles that I was going to be a doctor's wife, whatever that implied. I asked him if anyone had pointed out that he was going to be a writer's husband. He looked surprised. Why would they tell me something I already know? I've never heard the phrase doctor's wife so much in my life, I said. I told him that people kept congratulating me on his profession and that a colleague said if she were me, she'd give up teaching and a grad school friend asked when I'd quit my job. If they're saying you're a gold digger, he said, you're not a very good one. He had only recently divulged the amount of his medical school debt. My not yet husband kissed my forehead. Who cares what people say? Just before the plane's descent, the flight attendant came and told me to gather my things. More than an hour had passed. I envisioned my husband exhausted from performing chest compressions or birthing a baby. As I followed her up the aisle, passengers adjusted their headphones and children wiggled in their seats. There was an emergency on board, but the crew was professional and for the most part, the event didn't register. We passed through the curtains to where the seats were leather and leaned all the way back. My husband sat beside a pale woman in a suit. Her forehead was sweaty. She sipped water while they talked. He once told me he had planned to propose someplace beautiful, but then realized he was most enthralled with our ordinary life, watching Frontline and Conan O'Brien skits in bed, drinking coffee on the porch. That's why I chose the microwave, he said. Plus, I knew you wouldn't suspect it. The flight attendant pointed to an empty seat. You've been upgraded, she said. Thank you for sharing your husband. When the plane landed, an EMT crew escorted the sick woman to a waiting stretcher. My husband recited numbers to a paramedic who wrote notes on the palm of her blue plastic glove. As we left the jetway, I asked what had happened. She'll be okay, he said. He had more to tell, but he was waiting until we were out of earshot of other passengers. That night, we sat on the battered futon my husband has owned since college. His soggy medical license was drying on the coffee table. The flight attendant had set it down on the ice bin in the galley. He told me that when he saw the woman in the suit slumped against the wall, he worried she was dead. My other fear was that I'd be powerless to intervene, that I wouldn't be able to do anything until we landed. The flight attendants had handed him a medical kit and helped him piece together what had happened. She'd suffered a seizure. He had held the stethoscope to the woman's chest but could barely discern her heartbeat over the roar of the jets. When he checked her blood pressure, she whispered that she'd get medicine in her bag, which he got for her. Once she'd stabilized, he sat beside her until the plane reached the gate. They barely needed me, he said, putting his hand on my ankle. The seizure was over before I arrived. I squeezed his arm, thankful to be married to a man who didn't exaggerate his importance. You were there if she needed you. I didn't do a thing. That's not true, I said. I was realizing something about our marriage. At our wedding, we had made vows to each other, but before I met him, at his med school graduation, he had made vows to his future patients. Our marriage was private, but his profession was not. I'm proud of you, I said. I felt his fingers slide down my foot until they rested in the space between my first and second toe, where the dorsalis pedis artery passes over the cuneiform bones. A few years before, I would have asked what he was doing, but by that point, the maneuver was familiar. My husband, the doctor, was checking my pulse. Ah, it's so good. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's so good for so many reasons. I think it's very, very relatable as a physician spouse. There's so much you say in there that I'm like, yes, yes, I know that feeling. So yeah. I did hear from a lot of physicians and physician spouses after I wrote this essay, for sure. A lot of people saying that it felt familiar or that their relationship had 
gone through similar difficult times. And also from people who are in relationships and have a lot of doubts and wanted to know if I had advice, which is a little bit tricky because I don't know that my experience means that anyone else is going to, you know, nobody's necessarily going to have the same experience that I did. Um, and I can't really quell anyone else's doubts, you know, but I understand why they have them for sure. Yeah. It, it is a little tricky to give advice. I find myself in that position a lot and I, I try to give good advice on the show, but I always feel like I need to put a disclaimer out there, you know, Hey, every marriage is different. Every person is different. Situations are different, but these are kind of general principles that have helped me anyway. So before we started recording, you had mentioned that the editor for the New York Times actually changed up your essay a little bit. So I have to get the inside scoop on this. What happened with that? So, I mean, it's very typical in, in the writing process for an editor to, to suggest some changes. And one of the changes that he suggested um, was to take out this paragraph where I described inviting my husband to my classroom um, where I was teaching so he could see that part of my working life. And I put that in because I wanted to show that while he could view what I did, which I think made him sort of appreciate me more as a person and as a professional, I could never like go to the hospital and watch him with a patient because of HIPAA laws, you know, that would be wildly inappropriate. But what it meant was it was just another way that that part of his life felt inaccessible to me. And then the other reason I put it in there is because I felt like it was important for me to say that I'm also a person with a career and ambitions and I didn't want it to seem like that was an inequality in our marriage. We're both ambitious people. We both have jobs that we value um, and roles in society that, that we have chosen for specific reasons. So the editor suggested I remove it and it did kind of streamline the essay the Modern Love Columns, like a relatively short column. So I understand that he wanted the word count to be right. Um, and yet it's it's an edit I kind of regret taking because I've since gotten a lot of comments about like, who is this woman? Where did they find her? Who's so threatened by her husband's job? In my mind, that's a real misreading of the essay. I don't- Oh yeah, I didn't get that at all. I don't yeah. get how, why were you threatened? I'm still lost on that <laughs> So, you know, there's also bad readers everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely on them, right? <laughs> right. But I mean, I do, you know, I do feel like that is an absence that's sort of skirted around. And yet it's something that's really important in our marriage is how do we create time, not just for his job, but also for me to pursue what I'm really interested in. And being a writer is kind of a precarious job because there's not always any reliable income coming from it. So I've also been teaching and that feels like I have two jobs, you know, full-time jobs simultaneously. And then a year ago we had a daughter. And so there's a lot of pressure on my time as well as his time. And that is an area where we are constantly navigating and negotiating. And it's, it's not always easy for sure. Right. So speaking of marriage advice and how, you know, maybe you're uncomfortable giving it, <laughs> tell me just um, what works for you guys. What are some things you guys have gotten right in this balancing act? Hmm, some things that we've gotten right. Well, one thing that we've definitely gotten right is daycare. <laughs> I'm not willing to give up my job to become a mother, and he's certainly not willing to give up his job to become a full-time parent we settled on a daycare and we're both really happy about it. And our daughter seems to be thriving there. And I know there's a lot of guilting of mothers in particular about not being with their babies and sort of this idea that mothers are supposed to be available all the time. But that's something that has been really, really crucial for us is having daycare that we don't feel guilty about that we feel really excited about um, so that we can both do what we want to do during the day and then come home to our sweet baby. And anything else you've done that's kind of helped you keep your own sense of self-identity? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I won't lie, you know, the first year of a baby's life is exhausting because of nursing and because of his schedule, it's, the balance is really unequal in a lot of ways, 
But something that for me has been helpful to think about is that's just one way to frame it. I mean, my husband had to go back to work two weeks after my daughter was born and that was heartbreaking for him. And so there are times when I'm feeling like the parent who's almost always on call. The other side of that is that I would be heartbroken if I wasn't the parent who was on call, that actually my job affords me that space and flexibility. Um, so it's, it's important to see both sides of it. I, I think that's really helpful. And then we negotiate a lot about like on weekends I usually get Sunday morning as writing time and right now I'm working I'm actually just teaching three quarters time so I get a little bit of writing time in the mornings on weekdays sometimes so there there are different ways that we're working around it and we're still for sure figuring it out it's not something we have down pat yet at all Well, I love that. And I don't know that any of us will ever have it down pat, but I think we just all do the best we can, you know? And I love that you guys are listening to each other, that you're taking into account, you know, your different goals and desires. And it sounds like you guys are doing well. How long have you been married now? Four years. Oh gosh, you guys are still newlyweds. You'll make it. (laughs) You're doing great. You're doing great. How can my listeners find out more about you if they just want to you know, read more of your stuff or, or learn more about you. Do you have a website? I do have a website. It's anyagroner.com and my name is spelled A-N-Y-A-G-R-O-N-E-R. So it's anyagroner.com and then there's links to essays and stories and interviews and those kinds of things. Fantastic. I will be sure and have that in the show notes so people can connect with you. I think they're really going to appreciate this episode so much and Again, great job on your essay, a great job on your marriage, and I wish you all the best. Thanks for being part of the show. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Married to Doctors podcast. Our mission is to make successful homes happier. To learn more or to share your story, visit our website at marriedtodoctors.com.